All right, let's dive into Acts. Got about 30 minutes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give it all I got for 30 minutes. Um, if you have your Bible, and by the way, you should have your Bible. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Um, I'm not going to be all over the Bible this morning. We are going to sit in Acts 9. And we're going to read a lot of scripture. So get ready. I think we're going to read 31 verses today. That's a lot on a Sunday morning. We don't always do that, but I love the Bible. And honestly, sometimes I would rather just let it preach than for me to preach. And so we're just we're going to read a large portion of scripture. I want to give you a few keys, though, as you're reading Acts. Um, one thing I love about Acts is that when you read Acts, you're not reading it right if you don't have questions. What do I mean? I mean, here's a question that comes up in me. Can I just be honest? Because I think sometimes in the West, I think we don't see the book of Acts happening like we should be seeing the book of Acts happening. And that should prompt a question. For example, my first question that I'm asking, just vulnerable, why am I not seeing these things happen? I think you need to ask. Ask it. Uh, how were they able to walk in such boldness and courage? And then the third question, which is another great one, why do I read Acts and think, I don't know if I could do that? Like, you need to read it, and you need to let it hit your heart. I'm literally watching, I'm reading about people being raised from the dead. I'm reading about them going in the power of the Holy Spirit hitting people. I'm reading about literally an angel getting them out of prison. And them walking out of prison completely untouched and alive because an angel got them out. Like, whoa. That needs to hit you in a different way where you're like, what do you want to do in my life? Shape me, pierce me, uh, convict me where I need to be convicted so that we can crash in on acts and we can allow the Lord to go, I am not done. I want to do more. I want to break more people out of prison. I want to heal more people. I want to I set more people free. I want more people filled with the Holy Spirit. Because Acts wasn't just for then, it's for today. All right, we'll get there. All right, Lord, thank you for this time. We ask you that your word would just pierce our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Acts 9, Acts 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. This is a key verse for us as a church. I've shared this verse with our staff. I'm sure I've shared this verse on a Sunday morning for Vision Sunday because this is a really key verse for us. Uh, the regions of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria experienced peace, and the believers were going on, meaning they were following Jesus, and they were leading and ordering their life after two things, the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the comfort of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means the exhortation, admonition, encouragement, and consolation of the Holy Spirit. What was the outcome? Increase. The church grew. Not because Paul had a good message. It grew because of the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased. And that's, that's really, really key that you see this. And so what happened? An entire region, regions were transformed. Judea, Galilee, Samaria, these are not just cities, they're regions. The regions were transformed. Um, and it's really important that we see that, but how did we get to verse 31? How did we get here? What happened to make cities transformed? What happened to, to have regions transformed? 
what transpired in the other 30 verses of this chapter to get us to this point. And that's what I want to I wanna really key in on there. And I want us to, to look at, at the beginning of Acts. Is this on? Okay, I can't hear it at all. Uh, it says, there it is. Um, verse 1, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. This is Acts 9, verse 1, and asked for letters from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless. Can you imagine this moment? Hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Hearing the voice, that would be powerful. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. I want to stop here. So we meet this man named Saul. Verse, Acts 9 verse 1 starts with what? Breathing, Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Is this someone that you're thinking is going to change cities? This isn't like the... This isn't the on-fire ministry school student that just came out of ministry school and he's unleashed to go change a city. This is a guy that's persecuting Christians. So who is Saul? Who who is this man? Well, Acts gives us a lot of information about him. Uh, I want you to go back quickly um, to Acts 7, verse 58. Acts 7, verse 58. Stephen is being stoned in this moment. And I want you to see what the people are doing. It says, Acts 58, when they had driven him out of the city, this is Stephen, they drove him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. By the way, if I was being stoned, I don't know if I would say that. Can you imagine? In this moment, you're dying, and your last words that you're able to say are, Lord, don't hold this against them. Does it remind you of someone else? Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But what's happening in this moment is there's a ringleader of this, and the ringleader is Saul. And we find in uh, Acts 8, let's go ahead and move to Acts 8. What does it say? It says, verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So we have Saul. Not only at their laying robes at the feet of this man, he's also in hearty agreement with murder. He's in hearty agreement. That word, I don't know what other translations said, but the NASB, I'm like, where'd you get hearty? That's such a... It's an interesting word, right? They were in hearty agreement. And so I want you to see, Saul is persecuting believers. He's ravaging the church. And I found it interesting, too, um, just to look at Stephen's death and think this question. How could Stephen's death not have affected Saul? You thought about that? Like, what if that's actually a moment where Saul's heart began to have questions? Who is this man? And so here we find, and and so we we get to to Acts 9, 
where Saul is still breathing threats and murder, but he's on the road to Damascus. And what happens? Jesus meets him on the road. The most unlikely man gets met on the road with an encounter. He meets Jesus. And I want you to see, too, uh, Acts, um, just a little bit of timeline for Saul, right? Saul gets mentioned, his name, we see him known as Paul in Acts 13, verse 9. So, But he's not Paul yet, he's Saul. But we see him known as Paul in Acts 13, 9. Um, and we know that he's a Jew. He was born in Tarsus of Sicilia. Uh, he was brought up and educated under a, a really high-level Pharisee named Gamiel, strictly according to the law of our fathers. He was zealous for God. Saul was zealous for God. And in his zeal, what he thought was zeal for God was persecuting those following a false Messiah in his mind. And he's persecuting them in his zeal, right? Because if you don't actually know Jesus, your zeal for God can actually lead you in a direction you don't need to go. But listen to this. After after Acts 9, Saul has this encounter. And Saul would be known as Paul. And Paul would plant at least nine known churches. He would plant Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, Philippi, Thessalonica, uh, Berea, Corinth, and the church at Ephesus. At least nine that we know of for sure. He probably, he probably planted way more than nine. Uh, Paul would write 32,408 words, which is equivalent to 25% of the New Testament. Uh, Paul would end up being one of the most influential apostles in the history of the church. But wait a second. This is the same man who stood over Stephen and watched him get murdered. You're telling me that the same man that stood by and watched Stephen die became the very man responsible for a quarter of the New Testament that we hold in our hands today? Does this not hit anybody else but me? That's fine if it doesn't, but what happened? He met Jesus. The name Saul in the Greek means prayed for. His name means prayed for. I can imagine that the Bible doesn't say this, but I can imagine that there were people praying for Saul. I can imagine that even some of the apostles might have been praying for Saul. I'd imagine that maybe even people were praying for him. And by his very name that means prayed for, uh, his name would then, uh, he would be known as Paul, which means small one or humble. And so we have Saul, persecutor, hater of Christians, evil, murderer. And then we have Paul, wrote 32,408 words of the New Testament, planted nine churches, humble. He even says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I am the least of the apostles, but, but by the grace of God, I'm here. This is Paul. So we have Saul and we have Paul, the same man. So the prayed for one that persecuted the church and was one of the most hated men in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the one that was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death, um, ends up being, becoming the smaller, humble one. And he goes from hating followers of Jesus to having the humility to call himself the least of the apostles. So the prayed for one becomes one of the greatest testimonies because of the grace of God. And Paul, his very name was a reminder that it wasn't him but God. The reason I'm sharing this message this morning is because our vision at Convergence is encounter Jesus and transform cities. But I want you to see something. This is very important. Jesus doesn't Jesus never says never. I know that's a Justin Bieber lyric. Aaron's already singing it. Wasn't meaning to go there. 
What I'm saying is, there is no one too far gone for Jesus. And this is what you need to understand. This vision statement that we have plastered above the water fountains in the foyer, and we talk about it on Sundays, and we're like, encounter Jesus, transform cities. I need you to see the practicality of the fact that one moment of meeting Jesus leads to regions experiencing peace. The most unlikely man becomes the one that wrote 25% of the New Testament. Why am I preaching this? Because inside of Saul was a Paul. Inside of Saul was a Paul. He just didn't know it yet. Saul is proof that even the people we dislike, the ones persecuting us, the ones that we say are too far gone, are never too far away from meeting Jesus. Oh, it's going to get good. Jesus doesn't need us, but he wants us. He draws us near to him. And in this moment, he drew new, near to Saul. He drew near to the one most believers had written off. He drew near to the one who had blood on his hands. He drew near to the one that most would have said was the furthest from, from the Lord. And most of us as believers would have condemned him in our self-righteousness. We would have said, there's no way there's any hope for Saul. But inside of Saul was a Paul, and God sees Saul and said, that man right there, the one persecuting me in my church, that man is a Paul. And thank God for the grace of God. Right? What am I saying this morning? I'm saying the one who seems the furthest off is never too far for Jesus. The one struggling the most, the one caught in sin, the one we have written off, the one with a hard upbringing, the one caught in adultery, the one that says, I hate God. That one right there, God says, he's the one I choose to use. I choose to use the one who's struggling, who's broken, who's been wrapped in sin, who's been wrapped in stuff, who's been breathing threats and murder against the church. I choose that one to plant nine churches. Oh, but some of us, and me included, I'd have been like, there's no way he's using that guy. Right? I'm not saying there's not consequences for Saul's actions. I'm saying Jesus can bring restoration. He can shift hearts if there is repentance and a choice made to choose him. So the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus can use anyone. He can restore anyone. He can free anyone. He can draw anyone. I want you to think about your own life. I'm proof of this in my own way. I might not have been breathing threats and murder against the church, but in my own stuff, I met Jesus and yet I struggled with stuff. I've struggled. I've done things I'm not proud of. I've been like, man, I, I wish I, man, Lord, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, can you use me? Like, can, can you do anything with this vessel? Like, what, what, what can you do? I remember when I was really stuck in, in a desperate place of intense struggle. I remember asking, uh, telling the Lord this. I said, if you free me and break these chains, I'll follow you anywhere. And I said that not knowing that it would lead me here. I'm thinking, lead me anywhere, Lord, you know, and I, I'd been a lot to the mission field, been all over the place. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. Maybe it's business. I really had a heart for business, and I'm still doing business. But I said that prayer in a moment, not having any ounce of want, desire, or I want to be a pastor in me. But I gave the Lord a yes. I said, if you can use me, if you can take this broken vessel and you can take all the stuff and all that, all that stuff, if you can actually use it for your glory and do something with me, I'm in. Use me, free me, restore me. And I just said this thing, and, and I just say, like, me being up here right now is, is a thing that he did, he does, he can, and he will. I remember my daughter asked me a question actually this morning. She said, how can people all over the world become disciples of Jesus? And my answer was because Jesus is meeting people where they're at. And then as they come to meet him, they become more like him as they walk with him, which is discipleship. Yeah. 
Saul was the one that doesn't, doesn't deserve it. <laughs> Guess what? I don't deserve it. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far away you think you are. It doesn't matter how far your family members are. It doesn't matter how far your friends are. It doesn't matter how far they are because something happens when they meet Jesus. And by the way, Jesus can come in and he can change everything. And he can transform everything in a moment. That's encountering Jesus. That's what we're all in about. His heart for people isn't that they just come into a good worship service, sing songs, listen to teaching, tithe, and then leave. Ah, I'm out. I did the Christian life. His heart is for people to see him for who he really is, choose him, and allow him to transform him. So God looks around this room this morning. He looks around on the live stream. And what he sees, what God sees, is far different than what we see sometimes. This is why we need to pray for his eyes. We need to get his heart. What God sees when he looks around this room is that no matter what your life looks like, he sees you through the lens of transformation. That's God's heart. That's God's heart. He sees people that are like, man, I'm struggling in freedom. I'm struggling with pornography. But you know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to bring, if, he, if you choose him and, you, and there's repentance in your heart, you come towards him. He will use that and he will turn it into your greatest testimony. I was just telling the Lifestyle Christianity second year students on Wednesday. I was just telling them the story of my, my walk with the Lord, and I was just telling them, I said, the Lord has used my testimony in the middle of Trinity Park, Fort Worth, with 400 people there. The Lord has used my testimony about finding freedom to this day because I, what I struggled with became my greatest testimony. What I struggle with became my greatest testimony, and I share it all over the place. I'm not afraid to talk about it because look at what Jesus has done. If Jesus has done something in you, you better not be afraid to talk about it. What has Jesus done in your life? How has he freed you? How did you meet him? What does what happened in you? And boy, that when that starts coming out, I'm just telling you, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, not going to be the same. So as believers... We've got to get this question in us. What do you see in people and how do I partner with that? Because God wants us to see people through the lens of how he loves them and how he sees them. And we can't make a mistake as believers to champion Justice, righteousness, and truth without love. Because the very person that you might be condemning might be the very person Jesus wants to use to change a city. Because what happens when you don't have love? You sound like a noisy gong and a clinging cymbal. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Without love... I'm walking around on social media and I'm commenting and I'm doing things and I'm just blasting all this stuff. Look at this. Do this. This person's terrible. This preacher. Look what that pastor did. Look what this leader did. Look what that person did. Oh my goodness. Don't follow that person. Don't do anything they do. Don't. And we're, and we're spewing noise. And we sound more like a clanging cymbal and a gong more than we do like, hey, Jesus wants to pr you to pray for that person. And Jesus wants you to go talk to that person. And Jesus wants to see that person transform. Truth without love becomes pride. If I'm heralding truth and I don't have love, it, become, it can set pride, pride in my heart. I'm like, oh, look at me. I'm all righteous. So here's the truth. But if it doesn't come from love, you don't really care about that individual. All you care about is the truth. But you have to have love. Truth, love without truth is powerless. So you have these two extremes. You got truth without love is pride, but love without truth is powerless. You got to speak the truth in love. 
But in love is really critical. I see a lot of believers that are speaking the truth and there ain't an ounce of love in there. Love, how do we love people the way God wants us to love people? All right, I feel like I'm just kind of going, going somewhere, but Jesus meets Saul right where he's at because Jesus isn't just a good historical figure, bumper sticker, principle, or opinion. He will transform you. And encounter is a fancy word. Encounter, it's kind of a Christianese word. What does it mean? It means meet Jesus. I want you and I want everybody watching, and I want the world to meet Jesus. And as they meet Jesus, cities will be transformed. Not maybe, they will be. So this is our vision statement. Convergence exists to encounter Jesus and see cities transformed. So Saul encounters Jesus, and now I want to briefly hit on, on my main point number two. How, do, how are the cities transformed? And I want to give you three keys really quickly. Okay, Saul meets Jesus. His life radically changed. But now three things happen. The first one, Saul finds his people. The second one, Saul finds his purpose. And the third one, Saul finds his voice. So Acts 9, verse 10 says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Verse 12, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from this, uh, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Verse 15. 9.15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. So I'm going to do this really quickly. He encounters Jesus, the most unlikely man that any of the apostles would have thought would have changed all of these cities ends up meeting Jesus. His life radically changed. These entire regions, it says, experience peace because one man was transformed. He encounters Jesus, and then he transforms cities. But in between these two verses, in between this, Saul also finds his people. He finds the disciples, Ananias. Later on, we see Barnabas. Barnabas is, is the great encourager. And Barnabas actually takes up on behalf of Saul and says, no, you need to trust this guy. You need to trust this guy. And so we see here, the disciples surround Saul. They took him in and helped him when he was in trouble. In fact, God gives a prophetic word to Ananias about Saul's purpose. He says, you're called to go to the Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. So Saul found his people, which then God brought purpose to him through. So listen, your, your people are connected to your purpose. The people that God wants to, to set you into are part of your purpose. And so Saul finds his purpose. He, he gets his calling. And then the last is Saul finds his voice. It says he immediately began to proclaim Jesus. Immediately, and it says he was boldly declaring Jesus, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. He encountered Jesus, he discovered his purpose, he discovered his people, and he discovered his voice, and cities were transformed.
the Lord wants to use this house to see, he wants to use us to give us a purpose to see people meet him. He wants to use this house to transform cities. He wants to use this house to transform DFW. And the key is that we have to be willing to see the Saul's the way God sees the Saul's. We have to be willing to look at them and say, that person right there, I'm just telling you they're struggling with this, but that person right there could transform Dallas, could transform Plano, could transform Weatherford. What happens when you see people through his eyes? What happens when you get his heart for people? What happens when you begin to pray for people that you would never pray for? What happens, what would, oh... What would happen if we stopped bashing our political figures and started praying for them? Oh, I'm, I'm going to hit some doors this morning. What would happen if the very people that we think are persecuting Christians or Americans, what would happen if we turned that around and we said, God, I ask you that you would change their heart. I ask you that you would transform them. And would you use me to love them well, even if it doesn't look like what they're doing is right? You have to get his perspective. This is a political year. And one of the biggest challenges in a political year is we've got all the Christians and Christians against Christians. We've got Republicans versus Democrats. And we've got all this stuff that likes to swirl and bring disunity in the body of Christ. And this year, I believe the Lord wants to unite us and say, what if we prayed for our nation? What if we actually came into alignment with what God wants to do for America together and stopped casting stones? Because he wants to encounter, um, he wants America to encounter Jesus. He wants people to be transformed. That's his heart, but we have to see people through his eyes. Does this make sense? Okay. Acts 9 is one of my favorite passages. Because it really reveals the grace of God on full display. The grace. I don't deserve it. I was watching a video and all these guys were sharing. The question was, why do you think you deserve to go to heaven? And I loved all the answers. A lot of the guys were like, I go to church and I have the Version Bible app and I tithe and, you know, I, 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 I do good things. And, and, and this one guy was like, man, if anybody deserves to go, I deserve to go. I deserve to go. And I love what the last guy shared. So this, this one guy, he, he's kind of quiet for the whole video. And then all of a sudden he pops in and he goes, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But by his grace, by his grace, by his grace, by his grace, he comes into this little heart called Andrew Fish. And he begins to tweak and transform. And he comes in with his love because we love because he first loved us. He comes in with his grace. And all of a sudden, I'm up here with the opportunity to pastor a church, which I'm like, I would have never thought I could do that, dealing with the struggles and the chains and the bondage that I was living in, but God. And so what we have to see is, Man, we don't deserve it, but thank you, Jesus, that you've brought us into this place. Thank you that we are here. Thank you that we are, have the opportunity to be in this place. And so how do you want to use this body, this church, to see people out there encounter him and see Fort Worth and DFW transformed? I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But thank God he came. Thank God Jesus came. Thank God Jesus did what I could never do. That Jesus took it on him on the cross so that I don't have to carry that bondage and my self-righteousness anymore. I get his righteousness. I get to walk with him. All right, let's stand and pray.
when we say encounter Jesus, transform cities, this is what we mean. We mean Acts 9. We mean that Saul encounters Jesus and regions are transformed. That's what God wants to do through this body, through this church, through us as his people. And so, Lord, I thank you. We thank you right now. We thank you for all of the Sauls that are going to turn into Pauls. We thank you for the Sauls that are going to, they're going to be known by a new name, not, not because it's just a new name, but because they are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Because you've restored, because you've transformed, because you've set free. You've set free the captives. You've set free those that may be persecuting the church. Those that, that may be like, oh, coming against what you want to do, Lord, we thank you that your heart is so burning for them to meet you. Your heart is burning for the least likely. I thank you that I'm a least likely. <laughs> that in my fragile state, Lord, you took me and you said, Andrew, thank you for saying yes. If you will set me free, Lord, I will do whatever you call me to. And that led me to this place, Lord, because I gave you my yes and my brokenness. And you used it to allow me to be right here on this stage today. In my humility and in your grace, Lord. Thank you. I thank you for all the stories across the room. For the stories of of freedom from alcoholism, from the stories all across this room. I can look around this room and I can, I can, I know some of your stories, the way that you came to know him, the way he's transformed you. And he wants to do that to people all over this city. So Lord, we thank you that this isn't just a good, it's not just a good vision statement. This is our, our heart's cry that you would meet people where they're at and that those people would be people that would plant churches that they would end up starting businesses that they would end up uh becoming president becoming uh political getting into government getting into school getting into media getting into all of these things lord we ask you right now for the people that are in the darkest and deepest places that you are about to shine your light and there is going to be a call a call for people that are in the, the, the muck and the mire and you're saying, come up, here I am. Come out, come out, come out. We call to the people in this city, Lord. We ask you right now for those that are struggling, I ask you that you would meet them and that they'd have a Damascus Road experience. Right now, in Jesus' name, we ask you all across the city, all across the Metroplex, that people would meet Jesus today, Lord. That you would use us, that you would use other believers, but that you would also, just in your sovereignty and in your beauty, would you meet them right where they're at. I ask you right now, Lord, for cities to be transformed. For cities. Lord, would you give us faith for cities? Right now, we call the Sauls and we say, you are the prayed for ones. We're going to step in as a church and we're going to say, we will pray for you. We will pray for you. We will stand up and we'll pray for you so that you can, can be released into all that God has called you to step into your destiny and purpose in the Lord. We ask you for prodigals to come home. We ask you for people that are struggling to have chains break in the name of Jesus. Those that are struggling with addictions this morning. Those that need to meet you on the road. Lord, I ask you that you would meet them on the road. You would meet them on their Damascus road. Lord, would you use us? Would you use us, Lord? Would you use us as a church? Would you use us as a church family, Lord? Our desire is not just to occupy red chairs on a Sunday morning. Our desire is to take ground for the kingdom. Our desire is to see Fort Worth impacted. Our desire is to see nations changed. Not because we're good church attenders, but because we're on fire, passionate Jesus lovers that say, we will go, send us, we will go. We want to see people meet you. We want to see people meet you. So Lord, as we read Acts, 
I ask you that you would give calling and purpose. I feel like there are some in the room. The Lord is actually going to give you purpose this morning. The Lord, you've, you've met him, you've encountered him, but now the Lord wants to give you purpose. He wants to plant you with your people and he wants you to use your voice. So Lord, right now I ask you that you would allow us to use your voice. We will not be quiet or silent about, about the beauty of Jesus, about the love of Jesus, about the hope of Jesus. I ask you that you would reveal, even people in this room, there's, there's purpose that the Lord has. There's purpose on your life. There's businesses. There's kingdom business opportunities. There's, there's schools. There's principals of schools. There's teachers. There's government officials in this room. There's people that you're actually going to find yourself standing before uh, influential people that you were like, I don't know how I got here, but here I am. It's all because of Jesus. I ask you that you would pour out purpose in this room, Lord. Just as you gave Saul a, a calling, Lord, you said, you're going to go. You're going to bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings, and before the sons of Israel, Lord. Would you instill purpose in this room, Lord? We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, if I could have our altar ministry team come forward. guys can just line up right here. If you need prayer, I want to encourage you to come forward, get prayer from one of these up here. Thanks for coming. If you're watching online, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Next week, uh, definitely excited about preaching a message called Church Reformation next week. I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to do, but we love you. We bless you. Go and encounter Jesus and transform cities.